My name is Matthew Sykaris and I'm a director of the Cambridge Pro Bono Project or CPP. Um, and on behalf of the CPP, I'd like to welcome you all to this talk tonight um, and to um, virtual Cambridge. Um, by way of brief background, the CPP is now in its 11th year. Um, it's a research program run out of the Faculty of Law at the University of Cambridge. Um, what we do is to partner faculty members and graduate research students with leading barristers chambers, charities and NGOs uh, to produce targeted research on issues of contemporary social significance. Um, alongside that work, we also provide a network here at Cambridge for students and faculty members uh, with an interest in pro bono work and human rights. And to that end, we're starting a regular speaker series this year. And as our inaugural speaker, uh, I'd like to very warmly welcome um, Adam Wagner, who will speak on COVID-19 and human rights. Um, by way of brief introduction, Adam is an experienced human rights and public lawyer um, and barrister at uh, Doughty Street Chambers. Um, he's acted at all levels, including in the Supreme Court and European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and Adam is currently a specialist um, advisor to the Joint Committee on Human Rights in their COVID-19 inquiry. Um, Adam is well known for his human rights advocacy work. He founded both the award-winning human rights charity Each Other uh, and the acclaimed UK human rights blog, uh, and is also a prominent legal commentator. Um, he's also set up and hosts the Better Human podcast. Um, in addition, to all of this, um, Adam regularly lectures on human rights law and is currently a visiting professor of law at Goldsmith University. And in 2019, he was appointed to the Equality and Human Rights Commission, a panel of counsel. So we're very grateful to have Adam at Cambridge tonight and he'll speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, followed by about 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. Um, now, as a matter of Zoom etiquette, um, please post questions in the chat box at the very end of the talk. Uh, but don't post in the chat during the talk. Um, so a very warm welcome to Adam, who I'll hand it over to. Hello, um, hi um, everybody out there. Um, and thank you, Matthew and Katia for, to, for inviting me. Um, I, I find these um, talks that we, in this kind of strange COVID times, a little um, one way um, and all I can see of you at the moment is um, a kind of series of coloured circles with your initials in which isn't a great way to get to know people um, but I, I know you are humans and I will try and um, open up for discussion relatively early because these are this topic of Covid and human rights is utterly central to everybody's lives in, in, in a way which no other topic I don't think in the human rights world has has ever been in in, in my life um, but and, and, and it's almost overwhelming it's just such a difficult topic to discuss because you know COVID impacts on so many different parts of society um, but what I wanted to do first of all and first I'm going to break Matthew's rule and ask you to post something in the chat um, let me just um, share my screen um, I, I was reading today that the um, that apparently the, the Labour Party had a, a, a National Executive Committee meeting today where about 15 people walked out, but because it was on Zoom, they had to figure out what the what's the etiquette for walking out of a Zoom meeting. And apparently the person who made the speech on their behalf made this kind of very sort of solemn speech about why they were all working out, walking out and then couldn't find the leave button. So he was just sort of sat there awkwardly um, clicking on his mouse, trying to find out how to leave the meeting. We've all been there. Um, it's really difficult, but um, I, I'm going to try and... Um, yes, yeah, so if anyone is going to walk out of this meeting in disgust, please put some sort of message in the chat, you know, maybe in cap, cap, capital letters, explain what, what's going on and why you're disgusted. But another option is just to wait until the end and, um, and ask me a question. Right, so here we go. Um, you should now be able to see um, Matthew or Kat, can you just put your thumb in the air? Yeah, you can, or finger, all good. Um, so I, I call this talk the stress test um, because the COVID-19 pandemic has been a true stress test on the human rights architecture, um, not just of, of this country, but of every liberal democracy 
um, across the world and, and every country, regardless of whether they're a liberal democracy or not, there's a huge impact on, on, on basic rights. It's almost um, so such a big impact that it's difficult to understand and categorize. Um, but I just wanted to ask, um, and if you could put in the chat, I'm going to I'm going to put a picture up, and I want you to instantly respond and tell me who this is. And the, and the answer can't be the actor that plays. I want to know who the, who the character is. Who is that? Do we have an answer? Here we are in the chat. Die Hard Guy, 24 Dude. Yeah, no, Jack Bauer, that's it. He is the 24 Dude, Jack Bauer. So um, if, you're a, um, if you're a current undergraduate student, you probably will not remember this because this is when you were a baby. Um, but after the, um, after the September the 11th attacks in 2001, after the World Trade Center and the Pentagon um, were attacked um, by airplanes and thousands of people were killed, um, and the global war on terror, um, quote unquote, began. The most popular TV program for quite a number of years was this program called 24. And Jack Bauer was the main character and he was a hard talking, rule breaking, anti-terrorist guy who worked for the US government, um, so, sort of, I think for the CIA or something like that. And, and his whole, raison d'etre was he didn't play by the rules and, and whoever said 20 whoever said die hard guy you know you, you're absolutely right he was a bit like the die hard guy who was a he was a cop but didn't play by the rules and, and one of the things that jack bauer liked to do was beat up um potential terrorists and he was the guy that really that that, that, that we the public sent in to um to solve the problem of what do you do when there's a ticking bomb um, and it's about to go off and it's about to kill tens of thousands of people and you've got the guy in the room who you think has done it and you can't and, and the law says you can't torture them you can't you know beat them up but what are you going to do what's the answer and, and i think that one of the one of the the, the 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 lessons from the popularity of that show is that that under underlying a lot of people's um psyches it when they are under threat is this wish that someone will come in and break the rules and dispense with the niceties, cut through the red tape, whatever you call it, but basically um, you know, beat up the terrorists, torture the terrorists, something like that. And, and, and the reason I raise this is because I want to make a basic point, which is that times of, old, times of crisis and particularly times of threat to people's health and well-being or lives are times are danger times for human rights protections because they are the times when populations and governments say look we know we've got these nice rules but this is a super emergency and if we don't do something now we're going to you know people are going to die and the thing we're going to the thing, thing we have to do is this and we're going to do it and either they tell people they're doing it or they don't and there's a kind of implicit agreement from men, men, many members of the public who say, well, you know, okay, fine, we'll dispense with the rules. And I think we, we see that all across the world, world in relation to COVID, we see all sorts of norms. Um, so um, things that aren't laws, but are perhaps normal aspects of our constitutional setup or our political system, which we're used to and which survive because they are um, part of um, our basic sort of social um, system, they kind of disappear. Um, and, and they are danger times for people's rights because what we know from history is that there is a lot of bad things happen. A lot of things go wrong when there's a big crisis like this. Um, easier one, um, well, the first one's easy. The other three, who, who can tell me who any of those people are? Go on, stick it in the chat. And it's not Jack Bauer or the Die Hard guy or the 24 dude. I'll do the first one. It's Churchill. So you've got you've got the first one. That's the easy one. Can you can anyone tell me who anyone else is? Wow. Oh, two Eleanor Roosevelt. You got it. Spot on. The other two are, are pretty difficult. I'll, I'll tell you who the other two are, unless anybody perks in. Um, the other two are Rene Kassan um, is number three, and David Maxwell Fife is number four. D Rene Kassan was a French jurist who was central to the drafting of the. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
Um, and David Maxwell Fife was a British prosecutor. He was a barrister who prosecuted at the Nuremberg war crimes trials. And then he went on to chair the drafting committee of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, Churchill was an absolute central um, proponent of the modern human rights system. He said that there has to come a time when human rights are enthroned um, in the world. He wanted rights to be at the center of societies and not rulers. Um, and he was a huge um, supporter of the European Convention on Human Rights and the Council of Europe. And Eleanor Roosevelt chaired the drafting committee for the Universal Declaration. Um, and these are all people who lived through by far the greatest crisis that the modern world has experienced, the Second World War. And, and you might argue that it was the Second World War and the First World War combined, and with, sam with the sandwich filling in the middle being the Spanish flu, which killed more people than the First World War, up to 100 million people, this extraordinary time of crisis. And their solution, um, or at least part of their solution, was to create a set of international, internationally recognised and agreed upon rules or values, and they called them human rights, or at least they called this, that they ascribe this modern system to the idea of human rights, rights that every human has because they are human and that cannot be breached, they cannot be, they are inalienable, they cannot be overcome for any reason, it doesn't matter if you're um, the, you know, you've got the guy with the ticking, the ticking bomb in the room, it doesn't matter if you've got a um, highly infectious and deadly disease which is ripping through society, these rules are the basic rules that must always be kept to. Um, and, and at the center of these rules is, and this is the, this is the, these are the first words of the Universal Declaration, recognition of the inherent dignity and the, e and the equal and inalienable, inalienable rights of all members of the human family um, being the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. The inherent dignity, equal, um, human family these words were these these are the sort of that's the central principle of human rights and if anything dignity is the probably the defining principle if you opened up the root of the tree and you cut through to the middle you would find dignity because it is it describes pretty well what you want what your mission statement for society is it's where everybody lives with dignity and dignity doesn't necessarily mean having lots of money it doesn't necessarily mean having a particular job it doesn't mean um living in a particular way but it means you can you have self-respect and people respect you um for the person that you are and that's that's dignity um so how are human rights protected and um, i suggest there are three pillars to the way human rights are protected institutions law and culture and it's a pretty anemic understanding of human rights to think that it's just the law bit and I know um, some of you will be law students and and I'm a lawyer um, but I do think law is only one part of embedding human rights into a society um, so you've got institutions this is on my left pillar you've got international institutions like the United Nations the World Health Organization is a human rights organization if you read the charter of the World Health Organization um, its opening charter in 1948 it is about protecting the, it's about recognizing that health is a, an essential part of human rights um, because it gives you that dignity. Because you can't, if you don't have health, um, it's very difficult to have dignity. And obviously, it doesn't mean everybody who is unwell loses their dignity, but you provide a basic level of health, of health, health care um, to, have, to, to make um, it more likely that people retain that dignity. Um, local institutions, that's in um, every state has its own, has to have its own human rights compliant or human rights um, protecting institutions um, and government. Of course, governments play a huge role in protecting human rights. Then you have law. So you have all these international declarations and treaties. So if you're a law student and you're studying this, you'll find things like the U Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is, which is a declaration. You have the European Convention, which is a treaty, you have the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Rights of the People with Disabilities on the Rights of Women, these sort of substrata of the Universal Declaration. And they are where we find our the basic agreed principles of human rights. And they're not um, set in stone. They are, um, they are intended to be 
what what the Europe, European Court of Human Rights called living instruments. So they grow like a like a tree. They grow alongside society, um, and it would be it would be crazy not to for them not to grow because then you have you would have attitudes which would you know which were around in 1948 or 1951 um, being applied to situations in 2020, which doesn't make any sense. Um, you have local constitutions and laws. So in the UK, we have um, something called the Human Rights Act, which brings in the European Convention into local domestic UK law um, in, all, in various different ways. Um, and you have courts and other bodies which enforce those laws. And there's no point having human rights um, laws unless they are enforceable, unless they are, um, you know, uh, 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 if they can be achieved. You've got to be able to you can't protect rights with 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 words um they you know you have to be able to go and enforce your rights claim your rights culture um embedded values um th these are this is a bit more difficult but i think culture plays a really important role in protecting human rights you can go into any country in the world and say here is a human rights compliant constitution and here are some institutions with which have human rights embedded in them um but unless there is a cultural acceptance of these values, of values of equality, um, which you know not every society, but no society accepts equality as of uh, you know on, on, in in total, and we still have to fight for equality. But some societies that really don't accept equality, you know, societies where women aren't allowed to drive, or you know the, the, the you know really basic um, gay people aren't allowed to marry. Those kinds of um, you have to have cultural um buy-in so embedded values i think you can have slowly you embed values in society and what that means is once you've once you've done that once you've embedded those those values um into international and national culture and um and even into language it becomes a lot easier sorry it becomes a lot harder to um breach people's human rights even if the and either of the other two pillars are um, are corroded away, away a bit, um, and it's perfectly possible that you might have laws um, restricted. The, the the impact of laws might be restricted. You might have a change to institutions which make them less human rights um, protecting or promoting. Um, but if you have a culture of human rights, then you at least have some sort of um, mitigation. You have some sort of protection against that. Um, so that's just an idea of where human rights are. And now I'm just going to, uh, before I get on to COVID, I'm just going to talk about which, which are the rights. So we have here the um, 16 key rights in the European Convention, um, which are, um, which apply in, in relation to COVID, well, pretty much all of them. Um, certainly the right to life, Article 2, um, absolutely central, um, easy to forget in a weird way. And I, I'll talk about that later. The right not to be unlawfully detained. Um, there's a specific part of the right not to be unlawfully detained, the right to liberty, um, which relates to the spread of infectious diseases um, and, and, and the ability to detain someone to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. And it's no surprise that because if you think back to 1951, when this treaty was, was agreed, the Spanish flu, a killer far, which was far more deadly um, whether it was far, whether it was um, you know uh, more infectious or more um, deadly in principle, it was certainly more deadly in in effect um, across the world. It killed a hundred million, up to a hundred million people. It just been there. Cholera was still a huge issue. TB, all of these infectious diseases were part and part, part and part, part and parcel of, na of international culture. So it's no surprise that was provided for. Um, the right to a fair trial um, has been hugely affected by. Um, by the COVID crisis because courts haven't been able to function. I mean, they've got back to functioning in, in the most part, but very difficult to hold jury trials, which are socially distanced, um, very difficult to have fair hearings when they're being held online, as, as I, you know, and it's probably 75% of my court work now is online. Um, family and private life. Well, I'm sure you will have felt this very keenly by the debate about whether you're going to be allowed to return if you if you're in Cambridge. You know, are you going to be able to go back for Christmas? Are we going to be able to be with our families um, over Christmas as many people are used to? Um, but 
But forgetting that, what about the impact it's had since March, where many of us have not been able to see our families um, or our friends in anywhere near the level that we would want to or are used to. Um, I'll come back to that when I talk about the lockdown. Um, freedom of thought, conscience and religion, huge impact on um, people's religious lives, um, which have been, you know, people who, who are used to going to, to um, the mosque or synagogue or the church every day or every week have been um, unable to do that. Um, and it's, uh, there's just no precedent in history for that happening. Um, it's set for um, in cases of religious persecution, which, which this, this has not been. Um, freedom of association, we've not been able to protest anywhere near as much as we usually are able to. The current lockdown arguably bans protest entirely, uh, which is deeply pro problematic. Um, I haven't included the right to marry actually, but the right to marry has been hugely affected. Um, I don't know if any of you have been waiting for that moment to um, have, have your wedding with more than 15 people or even any people, um, but it's it's really um, unbelievable that um, you know a year ago that we wouldn't uh, be able to marry in the way we want to. Um, pe peaceful enjoyment of property, this relates to um, people having their businesses taken away from them. Well, arguably, Millions of people have had um, their businesses or their livelihoods taken away because of lockdowns and because of COVID. Um, the right to education, you know, my children were, uh, who are both primary school age were at home for nearly six months um, before they went back to school. Uh, you know, and they missed months and months of, of education. Um, and they, you know, online education is not, is not an equivalent to in-person education. This has affected a generation of children generation of children who couldn't take their exams probably some of you were probably in that category that you couldn't take your exams last year and had to rely on your predicted grades um and so there's just been you know across the piece there has been this huge effect but I, I i want you to think of it in this way when you think about through a human rights lens how you deal with a crisis like this this is this is the picture and and, and what i mean by that is that you have to be looking across all of the rights that's what I, if, I, if you take one thing away from tonight it's that human rights um making decisions through from a through a human rights lens or or respecting human rights is about balancing between different rights um and that is because you're not making decisions just for one person who is um who has a very particular sort of makeup of what they need and what dignity is to them. You're making decisions in this context for tens of millions of people. Um, but the decisions themselves have to balance all of these different rights that people have, both as, as people, as members of groups, as people with a particular identity, people of, of a particular race, people of, of a particular religious persuasion, people of particular political views. Um, it's not easy. Um, but just to take an example, I'm going to talk about the lockdown, um, but looming large over this entire crisis is the right to life. And there's no escaping that where you've got a, an infectious disease, a highly um, uh, contagious infectious disease, which has killed tens of thousands of people and has the potential to kill tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands more. The right to life weighs heavily in the balance but it has to be weighed against the right to people's right to private and family life, the right to um, education, the right to free association. Um, where the right balance is, is not obvious and there is no answer. You will not find an answer in a human rights court judgment. You will not find the answer in an article um, from the founder of the human rights movement. Winston Churchill didn't have anything to say about how you deal with COVID-19. It is, there is no obvious answer. And in a way, the government and the institutes of the state have been making it up as they go along. And I mean that in, in not necessarily a disparaging way, but just remember it's a balance. So the stress test. Um, I've already said crises are a danger time for human rights. Um, they reveal the extent to which human rights are protected across institutions, law, and culture. So a bit like when you, if you've got any medical students here or people have had you know, tests like this, when you, you uh, inject radioactive dye into somebody's body, 
to take certain kind of diagnosis, uh, diagnostic tests, so that when you put them through an MRI, um, you can see the the um, you can see certain things that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to see. And the COVID nineteen, this kind of crisis, is like injecting a radioactive dye through our entire society because it shows how our institution, how fit are our institutions, how fit is our culture, how fit is our law, does our law protect us? And you, only, you can only really know that in times of severe crisis because you suddenly see, ah, it turns out, you know, turns out the government can, can't shut down parliament. I mean, that's a, that's a different crisis. That was the Brexit crisis. But that was a good example of people did not know extraordinarily before the Supreme Court decided it couldn't that the government couldn't shut down parliament for as long as it wanted, couldn't prorogue parliament. Um, and in the same way, you know, could, can the government, um, could, can the government decide on, um, can the government impose criminal laws which affect everybody in the country and lock them in their houses effectively without parliamentary approval? And yes, it turns out they can. And there's not much we can do to stop it. And these are all, these are stress tests. Um, COVID-19 has caused, perhaps even forced, societies to balance and prioritize rights. So I talked about that balance, but we've also, along with balance comes, well, I'm sorry, I'm just um, hearing some sort of um, crisis going on in my house downstairs. So <laughs> excuse me, pausing. Sounds like everybody's alive, so I'll carry on. Um, it's not just about balancing, it's, it's also about prioritizing. Um, these are the hard decisions. If any of you go and work for the, for, in, in a public authority or for the government, it's not just about balance, it's about priorities. And it's not always obvious what you're meant to prioritize and it can change. Um, institutions have been central to decision-making. The state is back. I mean, the most extraordinary, um, the most extraordinary things we found out about what the state is capable of. It turns out the state can pay half the country's wages for, for, for six months um, because, it sh because it's decided they've got to shut businesses. Um, it turns out the state can impose these criminal laws that keep us in our houses. We've learned a lot about the state, or maybe we always knew that about the state, but we'd forgotten. Um, and that's what certainly Winston Churchill and Eleanor Roosevelt and David Maxwell Fife and Rene Kassan knew about the power of the state because they'd lived through wars. They'd lived through totalitarian dictatorships and had seen them firsthand in Rene Kassan's um, case because he lived in Nazi occupied France and, and, and I think escaped. The, we now know the power of the state again um, and we've got it, we should remember that. So, um, issues. I'm not going to deal with all 10 of these issues because I'm going to open up some um, this for conversation, but just to give you a, a taste of the kind of issues. So, so I've been working, um, as Matthew said at the beginning, with the Joint Committee on Human Rights on their COVID-19. They've got an ongoing COVID-19 inquiry, which has been going on um, since, I think, since March. Um, and I've been assisting with the, the, the evidence um, gathering and I think they've released five reports now and there's another one coming up um, probably next month or in, in the new year. And it's just bewildering, you know, the amount of issues which engage essential human rights, um, but which, and, and, and which are, in, in, in which the answer is not obvious, but are utterly um, crucial for people's lives. Um, lockdowns, obviously, I'll come, come back to lockdowns briefly. Um, state responsibility for deaths, you know, at some point the state is going to have to account for its actions in um, and, and the number of deaths. You know, there have been over 50,000 deaths related to COVID-19. Um, did the state, did the government act in the right way? Did the NHS act in the right way? We're going to have to find out there will have to be a public inquiry. There will have to be a reckoning. Um, it's going to be tough, but we need to know because if this happens again, which it will, because one thing about human history is that pandemics come back again and again and again. Um, we need to know what, what we did wrong this time so we can do it right next time. Uh, contact tracing, uh, we've set up a kind of state surveillance system effectively. Um, we've set up a huge architecture of um, people whose job it is to find out who um, a person with a, a positive test for COVID-19 
you know, had sex with last week or went out for dinner with or brushed past in a, in a bakery. Um, this is an extraordinary um, interference with people's rights, not necessarily a breach, but an interference. Education, I've discussed. Care homes, you know, tens of thousands of people um, over the age of 80 have died. Many of them have been in, in care homes. Have we done the right thing? How do we uh, account for the fact that in the first wave, so many care homes um, received infection, uh, uh, were, um, had outbreaks, local outbreaks? Um, what do we do about um, people being able to see their relatives and, 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 and touch their relatives and hug their relatives, these basic things that couldn't be more central to, um, to human rights protections? Are we going to have mandatory testing and vaccinations? Are we going to have freedom passes? Is it going to be a requirement to enter, go to watch football or to go on an aeroplane that you have a certificate saying you've been vaccinated for COVID-19? What about people who can't be vaccinated? What about people who don't want to be? Um, the international picture, we've become very local in our thinking um, with, with COVID-19, but the re every country um, every country is experiencing COVID-19 differently and some simply do not have the resources, um, financial or health infrastructure to deal with this, this virus. You know, what are we doing about them? What's, where is the international solidarity? We've become very insular. Um, state procurements, jobs, for, uh, jobs and, um, and, and contracts for the mates of politicians who say we were doing this in a super urgent way. We had to, you know, we had to just go down our, our Rolodexes our, on, on our, in our phone address books. Was it right? You know, um, and corruption is a human rights issue. It really is because corruption um, impacts on equality. You can't have an equal society um, with equal opportunities for people where the, the governing classes give contracts um, and jobs to their mates because their mates will be like them on the whole. Social services, what about all the social services which have just not been happening during the crisis? Um, and these are just 10 issues. I'm happy to pick them up in, in the chat. I'm just gonna talk about the lockdown for a minute. Um, this was a tweet sent out, I think in June um, from Bedfordshire police. If you think that by going for a picnic in a rural location, no one will find you. Don't be surprised if an officer appears from the shadows. We're covering the whole country. Um, and this is one of my favorite tweets of the entire um, pandemic. I think it was meant slightly tongue in cheek, but the idea that police are policing picnics, you know, that we, could, we couldn't have imagined this a year ago. And yet there we are. Um, the, the story of the lockdown is, is pretty extraordinary. Um, I, I want to, I'll tell that story, but I just wanted to give you two basic propositions. And these are propositions which I'm not, I'm not willing to argue tonight. Um, and if you believe differently, um, please argue it <laughs> elsewhere. But my basic propositions are COVID-19 is a highly infectious and deadly disease. Two, the spread of the disease can be slowed or even halted by social distancing. Um, if you don't believe me, believe the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization doesn't like lockdowns. It really doesn't, um, um, because the World Health Organization is a holistic human rights organization. It's not just about, it sees health in its wider context. And, and they said large scale physical distancing measures and movement restrictions often referred to as lockdowns can slow COVID-19 transmission by limiting contact between people. And you might think, um, that's obvious because it's an infectious disease that spreads through um, people breathing on each other and, and, and touching each other. However, these measures can have a profound negative impact on individuals, communities and societies by bringing social and economic life to a near stop. Such measures disproportionately affect disadvantaged groups, including people in poverty, migrants, internally displaced people and refugees who most often live in overcrowded and under-resourced settings and, depending on, and depend on daily labor for subsistence. Um, the World Health Organization recognizes that at certain points, some countries have had no choice but to issue stay at home orders and other measures to buy time. Um, but governments must make use of the extra time um, by doing as, all they can to build the capacity to detect, isolate, test and care for all cases, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they see lockdown as a necessary evil sometimes, um, but, it's, but it has these profound effects. Um, and the story of lockdown in this country, in the United Kingdom, is you know one of the most extraordinary complexity. You know we've had we've had something like ten different versions 
of the lockdown. And, and I've been um, slightly obsessively following all of the criminal laws which have developed over um, over the lockdown. I'm just going to I'm just going to share a different screen with you to show me you my sad table that I've made. Um, oh, I've, I've, I've shared the wrong one. Um, let's try it again. Excuse me. Where's the sad table? There it is. Can you see my sad table? Yeah, you can see my sad table. So my sad table is um, a table of all of the emergency laws that have been made in relation to lockdown since the beginning of the crisis. So it starts, we start here in on the, on the 10th of February, so about nine months ago. And here we go. It's pages and pages and pages of this stuff. All of this has been about our, the lockdown. There's been over 60, sorry, just done, so there has been exactly 60. In fact, there's 61 because there was an amendment to the last one. Um, laws, and each one of these laws came out of the, uh, some room in the government um, and without any consultation. Um, without they, they they appear like magic um, sometimes in the middle of the night the the the, the minutes before they come into force um, they use an emergency procedure which um, is under something called the Public Health Act 1984 which allows the government in emergency situations and I'm, I'm and, and it's the government not Parliament but the government so just you know Matt, Matt Hancock can just sign this law into law and it comes and it, it suddenly is in is in force, um, and these aren't just any old laws. This isn't a law about you know d d uh, dangerous dogs or um, you know, what colour to paint your doors. These are laws which are preventing people from leave at the moment leaving their house or being outside of their house without a reasonable excuse. So um, making all everything illegal, <laughs> all social interaction illegal unless proven otherwise. Um, it's the most extraordinary shift, and apparently Matt Hancock called it Napoleonic. Um, and these laws have, um, because that was the way Napoleon legislated, these laws have um, used this emergency procedure without having to go through Parliament until 28 days later, and by which time the next laws come in, so, so nobody's bothered about it. Um, only, as far as I know, a single, a single one of these, which actually isn't listed because it's part of another, um, it's part of social care um, laws, a single regulation has been um, struck down by the courts today, in fact, um, relating to the provision of um, social care to children. But none of these laws have been struck down by a court. They've been challenged a number of times. And the courts have basically said, let the government get on with it. Um, it's a severe crisis. Um, and, you know, reading between the lines, we need a bit of Jack Bauer in, 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 in this situation. We need the government to be um, locking people down, to be preventing people leaving their houses, to be preventing people protesting, preventing people getting married, preventing people see their relatives. Um, and it may be right. I, 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 am, I am open to the possibility that this, that this kind of legally enforced lockdown is the right thing. But that's not to say every aspect of it is right. I don't think it's right that, you know, a student um, who has um, a house party gets fined £10,000 in each and every person who was involved in the holding of the party gets fined ten thousand pounds but somebody who um who meets with a group of friends in a park gets fined a hundred pounds it doesn't make it doesn't make sense it's not all logical um but it is you know the 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 lockdown story is is really that the, has been the story of this um of this crisis i'm just going to finish off and then open up to questions um can i find my, there it is. Um, Lord Sumption, who isn't I mean, this? This is I'm, I'm being a bit a bit naughty because this is a this is a meme, um, which isn't a very good meme because it calls Lord Sumption the former Lord Chief of Justice, Chief of Justice, and there is no Lord Chief of Justice. But even if there was, it's not him. He was a former Supreme Court Justice, and he and he also says, but he says the British public has not even begun to understand the seriousness of what's happening in our country. Many, perhaps most of them, don't care or won't care until it's too late. They instinctively feel that the end justifies the means. 
the motto, not the moto. I don't think Lord Sumption has a problem with motos, but he does have a problem with mottos. The motto of every totalitarian regime that has ever existed. So the end justify the means is the motto of every, and he's right. The, that is the motto of every totalitarian regime that ever existed. The difference is that the totalitarian regimes that um, we do not want to replicate, we don't want to replicate any totalitarian regimes, um, have as their motto, um, you know, let's, let's kill all the Jews, or let's, um, let's um, promote the, the, the master race, or let's, um, you know, take from the rich and give to the poor, maybe that's something you'd agree with. But this is a different motto, and, and the ends here, um, the, the, me, the ends here are preventing tens of thousands of people from dying. Um, and that complicates things in terms of the, um, in terms of the this analogy, but also I, I don't buy the um, the argument that this is a some sort of slide into totalitar totalitarianism. I do um, very much believe that the there are certain aspects of what we've seen, which have been extremely concerning in terms of breaking those norms um, that I referred to at the beginning and with the three pillars. I think certain norms have been broken and we may find it quite hard to go back um, and particularly the, the the norm of bringing in of, of passing laws with parliamentary approval just seems to have disappeared i mean the, the government has now reached the position where it puts the the new criminal laws to parliament the day before where they, and they see them an hour before that and they're not allowed to amend them they can kind of vote yes or no and i just think that is not proper scrutiny and i think we've got ourselves into a real um, mess over that the government has got used to um, running the country by committee um, rather than in an open and, and transparent way. I think that that's a big problem. I think that the, um, the way that laws have been communicated, the way the rules have been communicated, the way that they've been enforced has been problematic in lots of ways. But I don't think we are in any kind of totalitarian system. And I also don't think we are in... We, this, this position, this situation can be compared to the evils of the Nazis, or, you know, it always goes back to the Nazis, but it's not the Nazis because the, we are going through a pandemic of a very, with a very um, deadly and infectious disease. And unfortunately, there is a direct connection between our, between our, what we would describe as our normal social activities, particularly gathering with other people and the spread of the disease. And when we go back to that grid with the with the human rights, different human rights in it, we have to balance the right to life with the other rights. Um, and what the right balance will be is, you know, it, it couldn't be more important. And we all need to fight for every um, for every right we have to ensure that the that we are heard and that the balance is struck as the right one. But I think it's wrong to say that you can just achieve that. By, um, by going on as normal, um, which is a slightly more political point than a human rights point. But I think that a proper human rights analysis, um, which I think every human rights organization has said, and, and you know, if you read the Joint Committee on Human Rights report from July, um, which Law Sumption quotes in his, his latest Daily Mail article, but he doesn't call it the Human Rights Committee, he says a parliamentary committee, because he has an issue with, um, with the way the human rights community has dealt with, with, with um, this crisis. But the Human Rights Committee did not say that lockdowns are inherently wrong. Um, what they said was, we are skeptical of the way that this lockdown is being imposed, um, and we are concerned that certain rights are being overlooked, such as the rights to protest and, and, and those sorts of things. So I'm going to, I'm actually not going to go any further with, with the presentation because I want to give you a chance to ask some questions. Um, and on that note, I'd, I'd like to thank you very much, Adam, for the talk. Um, and uh, for those who want to ask questions, type them into the chat box and make sure that you address them to all panellists and attendees so we can, we can read um, what you're writing. I think there's one question already from Alex. Um, and so we might start with that. Alex says, hi, Adam, thanks so much for joining us. Um, do you think a case alleging a breach of Article 2, so the right to life, um, on the part of care home residents is likely? I'm thinking particularly about an Osman and UK test. Do you have any views on that? Thanks. 
Um, yeah, j just for, for um, the people who aren't familiar with Osman, o Osman is a, a case about um, the real and immediate risk to life. So what the state has a duty when there's a real and immediate risk to life, which it knows about, um, reasonably should know about, to take all reasonable steps to prevent it. And um, there is a, I mean, quite clearly, the, the, you can't think of a, a, more re, a, a more obvious threat to life than this kind of pandemic for a care home where, you know, it, it's mo by far most deadly with people who are yeah, over the age of 80, or they, uh, um, who will comprise of most people in care homes. Um, I think there's, there's certainly a case to answer um, for what happened in the early parts of this crisis. Um, I think it can only be answered by realistically by public inquiry um, because it, only a public inquiry will have the you know the the, the f wideness of scope um, to and and the resources and the legal powers to get to the bottom of what happened it's such a big story um, because it doesn't just involve government decisions it involves you know care homes are private on, on the, in, in large part they're private businesses they each that they will all, all have their own different policies. They will have behaved differently in each and every instance, um, and I think that the that is a real open question. I think it's a question we've avoided. We as a society have really avoided answering while we're in the teeth of the crisis. But we're going to have years and years after, hopefully, the crisis ends um, of litigating these points and then going through the courts. Um, I've no doubt, but it's. I think it's an open question at the moment. It's definitely arguable. Um, I can see a question, um, Matthew, from Anna Magini or Magini. Sorry if I've um, mispronounced it. Um, she says um, she, she says she follows me on Twitter. Thank you, everybody um, who follows me on Twitter. Um, but but has asked whether um, the whether the fact that I'm I'm having to explain the lockdown rules to people has suggested that maybe the government has not been explaining them as well as it could. And she suggests a breach of Article 7 um, of the European Convention. Article 7 is the, it, it's technically the right against um, retrospective punishment, but it has built into it through, particularly through case law, that law needs to be accessible. Um, it needs to be clear enough for people to understand it. Um, Article 7 is a really weak right, in my experience, and I have tried it um, a number of times and I've never, got it passed you know the judges just aren't interested in it but the but it's it, it, it's there and and it's also built in that principle is built into other rights particularly the right to um freedom of expression the right to freedom of association the quality of law um point it's also built into the common law the principle of legality i think there's been it's in normal times these covid regulations would be you know being absolutely obliterated, uh, slaughtered in the courts. I, I think, I really think they would be. There's so much, so much that is vague and um, unclear and contradictory and doesn't fit with other bits of the regulations. They're, they're drafted in, in, the, in these sort of little committees in secret. Nobody gets to see them before they come out. They're full, they're generally full of errors, um, which get corrected later. Um, so ordinary, if that was an ordinary statute, um, which had been through Parliament, the courts would have no sympathy at all. But I think the courts have had more sympathy with these, but also they've not really been in the criminal courts that much because the criminal courts are so delayed. Most offences um, are being dealt with by these um, fixed penalty notices, which people, half people have paid. I don't know how much has been prosecuted. Certainly there just hasn't been the um, higher court law on this stuff yet. Um, not that I've seen anyway. I'm sure that the the criminal um, lawyers are dealing with it at the at the, at the base level, the magistrates' courts, that sort of thing. I think the the way that these laws have been communicated has been really problematic. I think just releasing laws in the middle of the night is bad. Um, the day before they come into force is bad. Um, you know, um, they it, it's it's really quite fundamental and, and I think also partly it's been deliberate I think there's been a deliberate method by the government for whatever reason to muddy the waters a bit so make it seem like things are stricter than they actually are laws are stricter than they are making the guidance 
stricter than the laws um, and it creates a kind of atmosphere of people being unsure um, but I also think it's created an atmosphere of people losing faith and trust in what the government are doing so I'm, I'm not I think it's backfired but I, whether it will be article 7 uh, possibly I, I think I, I just don't have that much faith in the courts at the moment to to take a big call like that and basically invalidate um, a regulation which has led to tens of thousands of fines and prosecutions but I don't I don't know um, I think we've we've got a question from Darren um, up next that engages the kind of interesting point really of if certain human rights breaches do have to happen how do we understand them um, and Darren says uh, we've seen several states make formal derogations under human rights instruments due to COVID-19, uh, most notably in Europe, Latvia, Romania and others. Um, do you think derogations are a more appropriate way for dealing with the emergency to demonstrate that these measures are temporary rather than rely on qualifications built into particular rights themselves, such as um, Article 5.1? Um, I think this is a really difficult one. I, I know that the I I, remember, I read the de derogations towards the beginning of the of the crisis. And I think the derogations all from places like they were mostly Eastern European. They mostly happened around the same week, um, and and I think they relied on a on a probably a wrong interpretation of a couple of cases about quarantine um, and about whether you could put people in quarantine under Article Five. Um, of the convention, I, I'm, I'm nerv I get nervous about derogations. I, I don't like the idea of, of taking a human rights holiday. Um, I, I, I don't. I know there's a kind of academic approach. So I, 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 I say academic. I mean, I know there is a theory that you derogate because you know it's good. It, it, it create, puts a timeline on it. Timeline. It's, um, it shows that it's limited. And for all the reasons you say, and, and I kind of understand that, but I just feel like this crisis is one which was 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 predicted by the European Convention. You know, it's it's right there in Article Five. It's right there in the in the fact that each of the you know the the the, the you know the right to free speech, the right to privacy, the right to family life, that they're all qualified. So they all have um, public health as a potential. Um, reason, a legitimate reason you can interfere with them as long as it's in, in a proportionate way. And I think that I, I want the state to be carrying out that exercise every single time it comes out with one of these laws, um, because otherwise, um, I, you know, I really don't want them to have, be able to derogate from from the, the, the those, those rights, from the, you know, the right to privacy or the right to um, freedom of speech. And I think that I, I didn't mention proportionality in my talk. I should have done this idea of this concept of proportionality is the balance. It is about um, only interfering with a basic right if that interference is necessary and proportionate. I'm sorry, is necessary and lawful and is no more than is necessary to um, achieve what you want to achieve. And I think that discipline is is really important. And 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 for me in this context of a pandemic. Um, is more important than any of the justifications for derogating. Great. Um, I think we have another question. Um, and this one is from Jordan, who may have just missed the start of the talk, but I think it's a very interesting point and one we could probably expand on. Um, and she asks, do you think the suspension of hearing and trials during the first lockdown could potentially breach the right to a fair trial? Um, of course, it's a very difficult question to answer, but what, what do you see as some of the issues being engaged there, Adam? Um, I mean, look, the, the, the right to a fair trial has built into it um, that it has to be speedy and speedy. <laughs> you have to get, 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 um, you have to get it on um, within a reasonable time frame. Otherwise, you know, it, it becomes unfair 10 years later. Um, we already were having a, a criminal justice crisis, um, which has been well described by people like the secret barrister. Um, so the actual, the threshold for delays that are permitted under Article 6 is quite high. You know, trials can take years to come on and it's not a breach of Article 6. So I think the reality is that during the first lockdown, you were talking about 
only maximum a few more weeks of delay. Um, and, and, and there was a clear justification for that delay um, because, of the, because of the nature of the pandemic. And it was really a severe, um, so it was really severe at the beginning, um, at the very least. And I think, I, I just can't see a court um, considering that a breach of Article 6. Now, there's a separate question or related question about whether the, the, the new kinds of criminal trials, such as um, jury trials with, you know, by video, you know, done in the theatre, you know, are they Article 6 compliant? I think that's going to be, that will be, um, that will end up in front of the courts and we'll, and we'll find out. Um, but I think it will depend, it will be very fact sensitive. Um, and, you know, and, and, and there's a good argument that getting a jury trial happening, even slightly imperfectly by video, is better than it not happening at all, or putting the jury members at risk of catching a virus that could kill them. So it's really tricky. Okay, thanks, Adam. I think we've, we've probably only got time for one or two more questions. Um, I know at, at, at the risk of showing favouritism, um, one of our panellists and directors, Katya, um, has a question to ask, and it, it relates to her own um, uh, home country. Katya, would, would you like to ask? Yes. Um, well, thank you very much for your talk, Adam. Um, you have sort of on one of your slides, you've circled a number of human rights that you think are most, you know, the most affected by COVID measures or the COVID pandemic itself. Um, curiously, or at least I thought curiously, you haven't circled Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights, so the freedom of expression and the freedom to receive information, which I find um, quite central actually in this pandemic. And in Germany mainly, but also in Switzerland where I'm from, we're having quite an extensive discussion on how sort of allowing um, COVID deniers to protest and, you know, mingling, COVID deniers mingling with sort of right-wing extremists um, actually affects this right to freedom of expression because many people nowadays, including myself, actually, I've given a talk on, you know, pretty much the same topic as you have tonight in Zurich about a month ago. And I was very hesitant to actually criticize the government, um, you know, from a human rights perspective, just because I did not want to be associated with these protesters. Um, how do you think that sort of culture of self-censorship that we are, you know, kind of, um, I don't know, starting to cultivate in, in this climate where you don't want to be associated with COVID deniers actually impacts the sort of the content and the extent of the right to freedom of expression? Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It should have been circled. And, and I think I just sort of, um, I, I put it all into Article 11, the, the right to fr freedom of association and protest. But you're absolutely right. It covers, it's covered by both. Um, I mean, I, I, I personally have no problem with, um, with saying that COVID deniers should be able to, you know, talk about, should be able to protest if they want to protest. Um, I think they should be able to protest. Um, I think it's reasonable to ask Every any protest to comply with social distancing regulations to do a risk assessment. That's basically where the law has been for just before this lockdown in, in the UK and probably will be going back. I hope it will be going back to that um, from next Wednesday that people can organise protests as long as they do a risk assessment and follow um, health and safety guidance, which you know isn't that onerous for, for a protest outside. Um, but obviously it poses a particular problem for COVID deniers um, because they deny that those measures make any difference. They deny that masks make a difference. Maybe they deny the disease exists. I, I, I'm, I'm actually quite comfortable with that, that problem um, because I think that's a fair balance actually. Um, I think th there, is, you know, there is a second question about spreading misinformation. Um, and this isn't connect this isn't just exclusive to COVID this is across lots of issues um, you know misin misinformation is a very very broad concept um, you know something can, and, and, and what would you know what would um, uh, Locke say about it he'd say um, he'd say until we we, we we don't know what the misinformation is until um, until you know later on that's the whole point of free speech is that you've got to allow a, these ideas to, to clash in order to um, find out which ones are, are true. 
Um, however, on the other hand, we do, you know, no, no liberal democracy is kind of absolutist on free speech. There is, you know, we have laws against racial incitement. We have um, laws against um, homophobic speech and, and, and maybe, maybe we can have, we should have laws against um, spreading particular kinds of obviously false narratives, which will, um, which will have a detrimental effect on, on, on public health. So for example, and I give this as an example, not as a sort of, I'm not making a scientific statement, but you could, you could make a case for once the vaccinations are available, people who, um, who say the, um, this vaccination is actually, you know, fake, or it's, um, it's actually just a way of, um, of, uh, uh, um, not Steve Jobs, um, I've, I've, I've lost his name momentarily. Bill Gates. Bill Gates, yeah, Bill Gates. <laughs> the, the other one, Bill Gates. I uh, know Steve Jobs isn't is like, um, sort of, you know, taking over people's bodies and controlling their brains. You know, th that is, you know, damaging stuff. As it happens, the first thing I, I ever did as, as a pupil barrister is I went to watch the prosecution of um, um, Andrew Wakefield, who's the, um, the, the doctor who um, uh, said that the, 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 the MMR jab um, caused aut autism and he published an article about it and he used all sorts of unethical um, you know uh, uh, techniques to get there um, and it wasn't true and he published a, an article in the Lancet and and, and he was struck off as a, as a doctor in, in the United in, in, in the United Kingdom and I think that there is you can there is a real public health danger to saying that vaccines that do work don't work um, because it impacts everybody in the same way that there is a real public health danger to somebody, um, you know, just going out in, you know, into a public place and, and organizing a, a, a gathering. Um, in, you know, these things that wouldn't necessarily normally um, have any impact at all, really, on anybody else, suddenly create this, um, this peril. So I, I think it's really tough. I, I would prefer people to talk whatever crap they want and get shot down um, through people, you know, showing them why they're wrong, because I think on the whole, that's the best way of doing things. And we should we should keep criminal laws um, about speech to the very, very minimum um, that we possibly can. So I, I prefer that to be dealt with um, through through argument. Um, but I don't I don't have a problem with protests having to fulfill certain health and safety requirements. And I also don't have a problem for standing up for people I don't agree with, um, giving, you know, giving, saying things that I don't agree with, because, you know, that's the point of free speech. Um, I think we've just got, um, I, think, I think we've just got time maybe for one more question, but I note that there are a few, few questions posted here, um, kind of challenging the bona fides of the government's decision to lock down. We probably don't have enough time to address each of them, but I guess they do speak to the kind of political disquiet that some of this has caused. And so um, I, I, I think I might ask the, the final question, trying to kind of draw together some of these themes. Um, and, and that is kind of picking up on, on two of the pillars that you mentioned in one of your early slides, Adam, that, that, that human rights can be regulated through culture uh, and also through institutions. Uh, and the, the question is, is really this, you know, in, in countries like Germany um, that, that suffered dreadfully during the, the Second World War, we saw a kind of new constitutional settlement um, after that conflict premised on concepts like dignity and the right to personality. Um, I think it's fair to say, um, um, to say that no such watershed has occurred yet in the United Kingdom. So the question really is, you know, um, is the culture of human rights there in the United Kingdom, um, in our courts, in our legal processes? Um, and if not, if not to that same degree, you know, where do we go after COVID? And, and this is a question that picks up on your work uh, with the joint committee. Um, are we going to see a change in culture? Ought we to change our institutions or does the current framework operate properly? Um, well, if you want to pick this, this question up, I, I gave a talk just before COVID um, um, called the, um, the, the UK's Dark and Dangerous Unwritten Constitution, which is on my podcast, The Better Human Podcast. It's about episode six. Um, it was actually in Cambridge. I gave it in Cambridge um, to the Politics Society, I think, at Pembroke. 
Um, so you can, it's the better human podcast. Um, I think there should be a written constitution. I think Brexit showed, demonstrated that. I think COVID has demonstrated that, that, you know, but I, I, I've got to stick with what I said, you know, it, through my three pillars is that you can have a really nice constitution if no one buys into it and the, and, and the culture doesn't support it and the institutions don't reflect it, then it's just a nice bit of writing. So you've got to think holistically across the whole of society. Um, I, I think actually, funnily enough, I think some interesting things have happened over people's, um, you know, people's support for human rights over this crisis, because if you look at the people around who, who are kind of, you know, who spread, who, the people who um, share memes with the Lord, Lord of Justice, Jonathan Sumption, um, they are not your typical lefty human rights people who I think have kind of dominated the human rights um, community in the United Kingdom since the Human Rights Act. Um, they are, you know, libertarians. They are right wingers. They are politically right wing. Um, that meme, I got that meme from Toby Young, who's, you know, who really ain't no lefty. Um, and I think it's really interesting that they, there's been a kind of awakening to the importance of, um, of solid rights protections, you know, protected by law amongst a different part of the community than the, the part that generally stands up for human rights. And what I really hope is, A, that those people will remember the lesson they've learned after this crisis ends, and B, the human rights movement will be um, bigger as a result and won't just be sort of um, a two factions who never speak to each other. Because I think those different perspectives, um, those different lenses through which to, or the, those different um, routes into thinking about, uh, understanding why human rights are so important are different to each other, but they bring in different kinds of people. Um, and I think I, I'm, I'm, you know, my little slight silver lining, my, 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 my glimmer of hope from all this is that there might be more, um, there might be more support for, or there might be less support for weakening human rights protections in the UK as a result of all this. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but, um, but, but, I, but think, I think it'll have to, it'll have to do. <laughs> I think, I think it did. I, I, I think it was an admirable answer to a very open question. Um, and I think on that note, it's, it's um, all the more reason why we should hold more talks like this um, to engage as many people as possible. So I think that, that probably brings our session to an end. Um, if you were in Cambridge, Adam, and we were in the Sir David Williams building, there would be a round of applause. Um, we will have to imagine that applause then, but I can thank you on behalf um, of the faculty and of the CPP um, for coming in and speaking. Um, this uh, talk will be um, uh, recorded or it has been recorded and will be published on our website page on the faculty and um, we'll send you a link, Adam, and if you wish to promote it, please do. Um, so I think we can all thank Adam and I'd, I'd very briefly like to spruik our talk for next week where we're having um, Sol Lehrfreund um, MBE come in to talk to us um, about the death penalty. Um, so a very different topic, but similar issues. And once again, thank you very much, Adam, and um, have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>